Uh, with that, let me hand you over to uh, our facilitator today, which is IAC CEO, Mark Cooper. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Kate, and hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. It's great that you could all join us and on this day where we have launched the IAC Critical Pathway to reopening conference meeting and training venues. These two, um, uh, two events come together perfectly and are there in harmony. Um, today we are going to be uh, joined by uh, Patrick Benicillo, owner of um, IAC Associate Member VGS Studio. Um, Patrick has been working with uh, IAC uh, certainly over the last four, um, four weeks of designing this guide, but then also um, uh, it, with the IAC members before that day. Um, now, VGS Studio, just to tell you a little bit about them, aside from being an IAC Associate Member, they are long-standing fabricators and interior designers and graphic designers. So as you will learn from Patrick, they are a one-stop shop in terms of providing the design and consultancy element to uh, mapping out and creating wayfinding solutions and partitioning solutions within venues. Um, and they have sales teams based throughout uh, the United States. And importantly, uh, Patrick's organization works with global um, organizations, restaurant chains and ships worldwide. So I know some of you who are joining us today are joining us from Europe as well as the US and Canada. So hopefully as well as it being useful content, uh, there will be some opportunity there as well for you. Just to add that VGS do work with a partner in the United Kingdom called Glimmer, a uh, global image uh, organization. So Patrick I'm sure will share some of that information with you. Um, as I mentioned, today's a special day. We um, have launched and published the IAC Critical Guide and Pathway to Reopening Conference Venues. A lot of the advice that we're given um, in there uh, have come from BGS as well. So thank you for being a, a platinum sponsor, Patrick, for that guide. Um, that's been really useful for us. I'm going to facilitate the session, so all I would do is encourage all of you to ask questions in the chat box, and I'll be keeping a careful eye on that, as Patrick will be delivering this session uh, in an area-by-area area stage. So he'll be looking at public spaces, bar spaces, meeting rooms, classrooms, restaurants, um, and uh, during each session, we will, at the end of each of those, reflect upon your questions, um, and particularly if you have started your redesign or even some of you may well have started to welcome back organizations to your venues and are having challenges, please share those challenges. This is a great opportunity not only to pick Patrick's brains, but I'm sure there are some of you I know in here that have reopened that might well just have the solution for one another. So do use the chat box. I'll be keeping an eye on that and we'll be sure to reference that regularly. But now, uh, Patrick, um, thank you again for joining us today. I'm pleased to hand over to you to take us through a wayfinding journey. All right, well, thank you very much, Mark, for, for allowing me the opportunity to host um, and share kind of our vision for reopening uh, you know, the venues that all of your members have taken place. Um, just as a means of introduction um, of the company, uh, just to give us the, the background of us is, again, we're a fully integrated company um, that's been in business for about 35 years. I'm one of the original owners and founders, and I serve as the head of basically national and global sales, and also as our uh, chief creative officer and uh, brand and marketing strategist uh, for Studio D, our division. Um, so basically our, our idea today is to help shift your mindset from panic to planning and leading your guests and delegates uh, safely back to conference activities. So with a full suite of recommendations and products, the idea is that you'll have a clear picture of how to consider, plan, and execute what the next normal looks like for your event venues. Again, relative to our company, uh, we're design focused. Studio D is our graphics and a communications firm that in this particular instance is gonna work on brand development, space planning, graphic communication strategies, consumer and attendee journey. Uh, we also play a role in marketing strategy, a way to communicate and successfully uh, plan your events. Uh, we're full service fabricators. We have 115,000 square feet of manufacturing domestically in the United States um, with a focus right now on COVID communication systems, floor and wall graphics, partition systems. 
sanitization stands, signage and wayfinding directories, banners, countertop and freestanding displays, and also technology uh, is in our wheelhouse and that we have a number of our own home developed technological solutions related to digital signage, touch streams, kiosks, and a focus on um, social media. So um, today's title, and first thing I really wanna say is I'd like this to be um, literally as collaborative as possible. Um, when the uh, virus had kind of hit, we began addressing um, each of our 12 different vertical market segments that we focus on as they were faced with challenges for reopening. Um, and we kind of pivoted um, about 180 degrees to really address not only in a comprehensive fashion, but in a very collaborative fashion, uh, what was needed. So the thinking behind this was to look at your particular approach towards venue wayfinding and screening for the next normal and trying to create top to bottom solutions to communicate and execute safety protocols for successful events as you move forward. So um, really just four major thoughts surrounding today's discussion. Number one, how do you and we create the next normal for returning to conference events? Um, I'm glad to hear that some of you have already started to because I'd love to hear um, how that's going and what kind of learnings we can take from that. Uh, the second thing is how do you make your venue safe without populating it with constant reminders of what attendees are fearing. There's definitely a fine balance between something that looks um, basically integrated into the environment um, and complements the architecture, but is not making it feel uh, like a hazmat area or where you're gonna overly concern uh, the patrons. Because the goal is to enable your guests to forget about their worries and basically immerse themselves in an environment that reminds them of why they love attending conferences in the first place. Um, uh, being a design firm, um, and the fact is at the moment, there really has not been an active um, project that we have taken on. Um, again, this is kind of new uh, to both you as well as how we've been learning from the other verticals. So we've created a fictitious environment to explore, and we've named it the Twin River Conference and Learning Center. Um, again, just to talk a little bit about what we do, again, in, in our design of vocabulary, we can create logos and brands and and conceptual ideation. And then uh, to also serve as an example, there's a fictitious event going on called DigiCon 2020. The main thought behind it is to look at some of the space planning challenges, specifically around a venue um, and different spaces within that venue and how you would address those and break that down. And that's where Mark and I have decided might be a really good logical way for us to look at um, that journey from the minute you pull up to the venue uh, across all of the different areas that each of your delegates are gonna encounter on the way in. So we started with a floor plan, a typical floor plan, and what we're gonna see are overlays that are gonna be focused on um, wayfinding, social distancing strategies, uh, partitions, uh, ways to maintain and minimize occupancy by the use of things like seat bands, um, wall signage communicating things, and a lot of wayfinding. So what we'll typically do if we were engaged by one of your firms is to take a look at your architectural plans and come back with an overlay that would show you kind of an opportunity towards a before and after uh, venue optimization plan. The same thing would also go in this case, uh, a fictitious second floor that were training rooms, a bar area, and all the like. And again, there would be an overlay to speak to optimizing the floor plan and putting in new componentry, uh, again, to create kind of a post-COVID normal, uh, while at the same token, trying to really integrate it in such a way where it feels um, basically organic and natural. So uh, what we did is Twin Rivers um, is based on kind of this blue color vocabulary. And Digicon, being the event that's being hosted at that particular time, takes on kind of this green and gray uh, color scheme. So what we're basically using that is to indicate what would be supplied, let's say, by the venue uh, to aid in wayfinding and creating a place for people to um, uh, migrate and travel through, and then what would be based upon specifically for the event in focus. So if you look at kind of an entryway in, the first thing is to get people accustomed to the idea of kind of wayfinding and introducing them the fact that we need to space about six feet apart. Um, you'll see it periodically things like hand wash stations or sanitization stands that are gonna be distributed throughout the venue. Um, and again, our idea is to kind of take you through this journey 
um, as you kind of walk into uh, a potential entrance and exit. Um, I will get into some of the specifics relative to things like partitions, how they're built, um, the actual signage systems at the literally end of the deck. Um, but basically we have all of these uh, parts and pieces and systems that we have uh, both in stock and our solutions that are ready to go. Um, so the first thing is, as you first walk in, um, an original floor plan might look like, you know, circulating doors or open and entry. There could be kind of a greeting area. And again, you might be headed towards uh, a check-in or a reception desk. What we've gone is we've then optimized it and begun to integrate elements uh, such as countertop partitions, navigational and distancing floor graphics, and directional and wayfinding signage that would then be uh, basically put into place. Um, so of, of note, for example, we make um, sanitizer stands that can either use your existing touchless uh, gel or liquid dispensers, or we also supply it as a complete unit. But once again, the welcome message is to the specific conference attendee or event or delegation that's being brought in. Um, as you kind of walk in again, we design this in such a way where perhaps there's a really large uh, kind of organic mural, but on the approach, you'll see something different here relative to asking people to space apart. And this is actually one of the uh, meeting spaces which we're going to address as we move throughout this uh, venue. So the first thing of note typically is at check-in. Um, this is something that's been picked up from everything from supermarkets through convenience stores, through restaurants. Um, is a partition system between the reception desk or a concierge or anybody on your staff um, to basically create a divider between uh, the guest and the delegate uh, during the check-in process. Our systems are such that they also allow for communication to be posted on the side of these particular panels as you walk along. Um, and again, here's another vantage point where you would be peppering in perhaps uh, messaging specifically around uh, protocols that are going to be um, expected of you while in attendance. There's a lot of discussion, especially here in the States, about you know no mask and no service. So I, I imagine that that would be part of kind of the recommendations as we're taking guidance from things like the CDC or World Health or any other um, kind of uh, consultancy that's in the world of uh, best in practice um, uh, medical consultancy. Um, once you get through the lobby, um, you have obviously a conference registration area. Um, the thinking here is where you would typically have put, say, maybe it's just a six foot folding table um, where maybe you're handing out badges or materials. Um, we've developed a, a partition system that can fold up and is on wheels and can be um, basically an, a place where you'd be able to prop that up in front of the typical table areas you'd be welcome to not only the venue, uh, Twin, Twin, Twin Rivers, but there might be um, changeable graphics. These are, these are snap frames and these can be either posters that we can create for you um, and the opportunity to kind of custom tailor um, kind of what would be the conference or the event. So this would be where you'd be working with your event planning group um, in conjunction with, for example, hosting Digicon to speak to maybe what their new routine might be um, in welcoming uh, delegates to it. And again, there are basically floor decals as you await to get those materials. Um, there's definitely gonna be a high prevalence of sanitization and reminders to do such. Um, and the key here is to do something that feels branded um, and unique to the venue um, once again, so it feels somewhat organic and not like um, you know, kind of a, a health um, element. Um, typically off of a lobby, you might see you know, clusters of tables, there might be a cafe or a little waiting area. Um, taking into account now uh, table limitations and sizes and six foot distancing, um, we've basically been able to create um, these partition systems that are done as either singles, um, L-shaped units, T-shaped units, or these quads that create almost these private intimate, um, we call them like booth builders. So if we were to look at a cafe area, taking a cue from our food service relationships, you're now going to see a partition system with a pass through, um, whether they were ordering coffees or if this was like a We Proudly Brew Starbucks area, um, you might have that. Um, there's still been a little bit discussion again relative to the use of masks and maybe seating uh, groups of four people at a time um, and then creating a distancing not only between the tables 
but partition systems as you look into uh, this specific little seating environment. Once again, we're trying to leverage some materiality that feels uh, organic to the architecture. So if you're using blonde woods or you know, faux slate, uh, there are ways to make this feel a little bit more, um, again, architecturally in keeping with uh, the physical spaces. We took an alternate approach here, uh, again, with different types of furnishings, but once again, creating something that um, at the same time, creating a sense of distancing, but also having it feel a little bit more um, intimate, a little bit more of a private uh, meeting area. You'll also find, you know, countertop displays, reminding people if they feel sick to please leave. Um, I imagine that there'll be some type of elements relative to temperature checking for some of your venues. Uh, masks will likely probably be required uh, during public areas, and there are just subtle ways to remind people to do that. Um, so that would be, again, a vantage point as you look at the cafes. Um, Mark, what I wanted to do, as I mentioned, in speaking through kind of the zones, um, this is a space where then I'd be taking us into panel and banquet rooms, but I wanted to pause momentarily to see if anybody had any questions, um, as I'm, again, trying to uh, divvy this up into thirds and then allow for some closing questions. So has anything come up at this particular point that you had questions or, uh, better yet, uh, problems or concerns uh, that you're challenged with? Our, our goal out of this is to be very collaborative and to help you create solutions that maybe we haven't even thought of yet. Um, anything is coming up at the moment? Mark, are you there? Ah, there we are. Sorry about that, Patrick. I was uh, just needing Kate to unmute me there so that I could speak. Um, uh, can you hear me okay now? I can, yes. Perfect. Um, I, I guess um, the, the, the one question I, I have for you in regards to that early part where you were talking about the branding for, uh, for the client as well as branding to the venue, uh, vice mm -hmm. versa, how, how affordable would it be to brand any wayfinding piece of equipment to a single client event rather than the venue? Are there certain um, parts of, you know, parts of the inventory that lend itself very well to very quick, affordable client-based branding um, uh, that, that you can call upon each week? Yes, uh, very much so. So the, the structure uh, by design, um, again, is either one of, one of two ways. Um, we either use a system uh, it's, it's something that we had created. We have about 21 different patents that we've developed through um, my career. One of which is this um, lens-based um, kind of a lift up polycarbonate. Um, what happens here is that we're able to just usually uh, create print on demand posters uh, that you could actually do uh, locally. Um, so the idea is if we design something for you um, that was templated, um, you literally can run to a local print shop and create uh, print-on-demand paper-based posters that you'd slip underneath our, uh, it's called MagaFrame and a Maga lens, um, and it allows you very economically to create something that feels unique and tailored to whether it be um, either practices or policies that have changed um, as this evolves, um, or if you wanted to allow the event um, to come up with a specific things as well. Again, in the past, I would always see easels, you know, sporadically distributed um, throughout the space. Um, and those are typically foam core or, you know, digitally printed coroplast, very inexpensive plastics. Something like this is just as economical, but actually even ships uh, in a tube. So this can be basically rolled up. It's a magnetically based paper uh, that you'd basically be able to kind of uh, put onto the stand. So I don't know if that right. helps to clarify. No. That's perfect, thank you. And the only other comment is a comment from Brian uh, from Chubb Center, and he was loving the clear panels between the tables in that area. And I have to admit, when I was looking at them, not only did I like them, but actually I thought they provide a good sound barrier as well uh, for those that are having the smaller breakout meetings. So uh, thank you, Brian, for that feedback. And anyone else, do throw up questions as we go along, but back over to you in the next section. Wonderful. The nice thing about these partitions is as we're starting to implement them in restaurants, 
Um, not only is it alleviating uh, your consumers' fears, um, but it's actually, um, when you get to certain areas like banquettes and booths, um, there's a little bit of an element of privacy that you feel you're now picking up on. Um, and I actually think uh, in an odd way, um, especially in the context of meetings or having one-on-one -on -one discussions, um, it's a nice opportunity to, like you said, create that sound barrier and a sense of intimacy that had not existed. So um, if there was one element of silver lining, that would be it. Um, so let's look at three uh, typical types of spaces uh, that you might encounter. One might be uh, what we'd consider to be your typical kind of um, collaborative, you know, a breakout or panel discussion where once, uh, again, rather than, right now, rather than us doing with Zoom, you know, you might be at the podium, Mark, and maybe asking Q&As of people around the stage. Um, this might have been a little bit more of an informal type of environment. The second area we're going to look like would be something that would be typically set up in an auditorium or a stage style format. Uh, and the third area I'd like to speak to would be, uh, you know, again, a, a banquet hall or what is, um, you know, a buffet begin to look like as it relates to food service. So once again, you can kind of see this overlay of partitioning, wayfinding, and getting people cued uh, in such a way um, to not only provide um, something that's organized and well thought out, but again, a, I think there's a, a nice element here that helps to kind of embellish um, the specific event. Um, so let's just take a look at this space. And I deliberately kind of uh, created a model that was very neutral in color palette, right? So this you know, may be white, it might be who knows. But the main focus was to speak about um, how you would utilize movable partitioning systems to create space that otherwise hadn't existed. So uh, perhaps there might be a speaker who's up on front of the stage. Once again, we have folding movable uh, partition systems that could basically encapsulate the podium. Uh, once again, this can be a split panel, um, but what they would be probably be mic'd up anyway. Um, there are ways to create uh, partitions between uh, people that could be frosted or clear, um, and again, don't necessarily have to be this tall. And as we kind of rotate around the venue, you begin to see um, how these can be used, um, where, for example, in this particular sofa setup, um, there were four pillows. Um, we've basically turned it into like just two people would sit here so you'd be able to maintain some spacing or you could create a partition uh, between here. So uh, the fact that all of these elements are um, movable, um, they uh, also from a, a mechanical perspective, they're very much designed like a trade show would be uh, done. So they, they, they become uh, disassembled, um, they're modular, uh, they can be reconfigured. And what I mean by that is if we created a unit that's a single panel, you can just as easily uh, put a return on it this way and this way. So it could become a single T-shaped unit or a quad, depending upon how you needed to outfit the room. If you had something like a, like a high top desk, or again, this something, this can exist in one of the training rooms, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, there are ways to partition systems that would be permanent. So you have training rooms, um, that from an event-based thing might be a semi-permanent solution uh, that you can look at. And then there's also a way of kind of uh, taking people through that journey, welcoming them in, into the physical space, um, and once again, having everybody kind of um, you know, sanitize their hands upon entry, and again, to speak in, in relatively friendly terms, ways to help spread um, you know, COVID-19 and the space out a bit. Um, that second room that we migrated was something more of an auditorium format and, and best practice at the moment is alternating seats and creating about a 50% capacity uh, in terms of fixed positioning, whether it be an auditorium or some type of a stage setup. So we've created spandex um, elastic uh, belly bands that would go over um, chairs um, and could be branded and basically ask people to, uh, to skip. Uh, once again, uh, these things are collapsible and interchangeable. But if you had, say, a, a panel or some kind of a speaking group up front, um, there would be something that would be a partition system that would go along the front. And then if you needed to return it on the sides, you can see how it could create a barrier between the speakers um, so they are um, socially distanced. The, the key to this whole thing is, and we've been reading a lot about, that in the absence of a true six-foot spacing, what has been accepted for all intents and purposes, what they call impermeable barriers. So um, the fact that we're using polycarbonate and acrylic, um, where people in theory are being prevented from uh, you know, breathing or coughing 
on one another. Um, this serves as a, a very viable alternative um, in a case where you just don't have the abilities to physically create a six foot distancing strategy. And once again, you can, you can see these kind of stretch fabric elements that would be used for the venue um, and private labeled like, you know, please leave this seat unoccupied. Um, and it's very simple. It's, it's a stretch, uh, stretch spandex and has kind of a Velcro attachment that wraps around the back. Um, so these are digitally printed, um, unique to the venue. And then we are trying to also do things like one-way traffic where you'd come in and go around and exit. Um, the third uh, venue, let's say, would be the entry to the, to the ballroom or if you were doing, let's say, a buffet breakfast and then you had to kind of change uh, for, for some kind of an eating. Um, what we're seeing for the most part is, again, tables that may have had you know, 10 or 12, uh, perhaps being reconfigured into four tops, five tops, or maybe uh, six. Uh, taking a cue from the restaurant industry, depending upon um, people and how they were invited to an event, um, we've created these really nice uh, movable um, shields. They just um, are meant to be completely transparent, um, still allowing for things like center uh, uh, what do you call them, centerpieces, whether they be floral or towers, can still be kind of decorative in nature, um, but um, come in black, silver, and wood tones. And basically, it's a process we have called grip flex. We're, we're actually able to route a groove into a solid piece of material, and this piece of plexi just presses right into it um, and creates a barrier. So the thinking is, if you were hosting a wedding or an event, uh, the, 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 the plus one would be sitting um, next to one another. Um, from across the table, there would be adequate distance because of just the size of the table to begin with, um, but you'd be able to have that space. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about like your bar stations. So um, there would be the bartender. Um, there would basically be about an eight to 12 inch slot. Um, this would be covering, uh, for example, the, the beverages or the liquor. There would be a return placed onto it, um, and then drinks would be passed through. If this was a, a six foot uh, buffet table or a 12 foot buffet table, um, as we zoom in here, the thinking is, is that um, in lieu of a traditional table skirt, there would be a, a partition system that would be in front. Um, the person or the server would be back behind the line. They would be communicating what they'd like. Um, and then again, there'd be this pass through that would go a little bit beyond the table where they can take their physical product. Uh, there's also opportunities for us if we wanted to, to put baskets where there might be um, you know, pre-wrapped utensils, if the utensils aren't here, or disposable utensils, if, if that was something uh, that was going to be mandated. So once again, you've got a pretty neutral uh, banquet facility uh, with a lot of moving parts, so you can set the stage um, literally and figuratively however you would need, um, and still maintain what I would consider to be some of the glamour um, associated with that. Um, on that same floor, we just would like to talk uh, as, a, a, again, a traditional kind of a conference room setup. This one originally had a capacity of 14 people. Um, that might be uh, too much uh, at this particular point. So we're using the strategy of uh, movable partitions, again, that could just be laying on the desk, as well as uh, belly bands, either uh, inactivating chairs or just removing chairs um, out for a moment. Uh, what's going on here? With and Patrick, if I can, um, just um, one comment that came in from Glenn. He really liked the elastic seat bands and said it'd be helpful and, and longer lasting. But um, I just had one question. As you flip from, from an auditorium to a boardroom setting, they're going to be different chairs with different yep. dimensions. Mm -hmm. do, they, do, do they allow for adjustment or do you have to have those bands created for a certain chair? No, what we have right now, it's been working pretty well, is we have um, about, we have two different widths and two different lengths. Um, and the idea uh, is such that um, because it's a stretch material <clears throat> um, and you, you pretty much know a, a seat back <clears throat> and a seat um, depth for a moment. If you can see back here, um, they're designed to kind of go around and stretch. And then there's a sewn pocket uh, mark at the top and the bottom. And what happens is, is if you've ever seen like a, an elastic Velcro strap, um, it kind of um, straps along here um, and is Velcroed to it. Um, so we've come up with two standard widths and lengths that seem to be working for a variety of applications, whether it's a, a business type of chair, a, um, a, a chair that's uh, used in a banquet hall or an auditorium. Uh, so thus far, that's, that they've been very successful with about two different sizes. 
if you had something unique, um, again, and just because of the volume and the fact that they're printed on demand anyway, um, it would be no problem to customize it uh, to, to your right. needs and requirements. Good to know. No, yeah. they, they look great. Thank you. Yeah. And the same thing here. These are very lightweight. Um, they use a very economical, just eighth inch thick um, polycarbonate and acrylic. Um, but again, using our systems, um, this is a, a material that we can route and basically they can be used um, this way or to create uh, T divisions. Um, so again, you can get a sense of, of how to create uh, an environment that would allow people to um, socially distance and at the same time have uh, a reasonable amount of um, uh, you know, clear visibility to the, to the people that they're engaged with. Um, and once again, this is kind of a good a good vantage point. Um, I was going to take a break there. Is that is that the only question that had popped up, Mark, relative to the... Um, let me take a look. Another couple have come in. Um, Susan agrees, very sharp look and practical way to customize the message. And Claire, um, makes sense in an auditorium, but, but what is the purpose with non-fixed chairs that could just be removed? Um, Absolutely. Perhaps I'm missing something. No, um, it's it's a it's a what it what it's really designed to do is um, in an auditorium it's definitely more effective. Uh, in reality, you would probably just remove the chairs. Um, but I just wanted to show uh, for any right. practical settings or, that you do or have. Or it's a idea. deliberate or, or it's a deliberate barrier to avoid people then just forgetting and pulling their chairs closer to each other. Um, but, Correct. Yeah, no, but yeah. very good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. Subtle reminder, absolutely that 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 you know, this vacancy is there for a reason. Um, and it also, in theory, could limit you having to have storage problems. You know, again, I don't know how many of these you would have, but um, that's a good point, Mark. I didn't even think about that, but it could be a, a deliberate way to say that <laughs> this is being vacated. And it, again, does force you to not try and get closer. So Probably your last point is the most important to everybody on this call, which is the lack of storage. So it allows people to keep the that stock in there and don't have that problem. So uh, that's great, but good, good, very good question. Thank you, Claire. Um, and uh, we're good to carry on. Cool. So the next would be a, a training classroom. And these are gonna be, you know, very different um, in, in terms of strategically how, how we would go about doing it. Again, we, we did our best to kind of come up with one that um, had kind of, uh, let's call it fold down seating. Um, and again, these are relatively tight for all intents and purposes, right? Um, you know, you got chairs literally sitting right next to one another. Um, so I took this is this is like the worst case scenario where, where I've seen furniture that um, for all intents and purposes is, is non movable. When we look at like getting people to go into specific training rooms, um, you know, there's a little bit again of, of, of navigational flow and wayfinding and reminding people to keep uh, six foot distancing as they're walking through. Um, if people are not attending the event to kind of keep on moving. Uh, there's a lot of uh, attempts to try and get one-way corridors, but I, I imagine in your venues, they're not as tight uh, as an office building. Um, office buildings tend to be where you might have like a six-foot corridor unto itself, um, but the idea is you probably have 10 or 12 feet widths. But um, again, this is a little bit of thinking here as it relates to that. Um, you might again, be encountering a hand wash station or a sanitization station as you kind of come that was in. One of, that was great timing because that was one of the questions. Nadia said, can you show an example of a hand washing station? Yep. So there are, um, again, that's something we, we don't manufacture hand washing statement, uh, stations, but I do know of a number uh, that are portable um, where you'd be able to refill <clears throat> and even offer, um, you know, um, hot and, and cold water. So um, I did come across a number of sources in my research if, if anybody needed those. Um, but if, um, if you wanted to do that in lieu of sanitization, um, that's definitely something that is viable. It, it looks like some are interested in, in knowing uh, any of those, uh, those manufacturers or providers that, that you uh, have researched, yeah. Patrick, that would be great. Yeah. We can Wonderful. share that post, post event with the follow-up link to this, uh, the, this online webinar, which will be recorded. Yeah, again, very frequently used in cafeteria settings for a lot of our um, contract food service customers. So I have a number of sources I can share with you later, Mark. Um, Thank you. And then again, a little bit more here. Once we get into the physical rooms, this is what I was talking about, where you might see, uh, you know, furnishings that might be a continuous in, in nature. Um, so you, you're going to, in this case, really want to uh, do a combination of partitioning 
um, and uh, kind of the seat bands, um, as well as if, if chairs themselves are around the perimeter, just you know, arbitrarily creating six foot distance between them. So I did kind of a bird's eye view. But upon entering, again, whether you didn't have a hand washing station as you'd walk in, uh, getting people to sanitize their hands, of course, crossing the, uh, the entryway in, uh, six foot distancing. Um, if there was, you know, let's call it the teacher or the instructor up front, <clears throat> could be behind, again, a portable a barrier that can sit on top of the desk. Um, again, if there was a podium or something here or a, a, an element that you needed to create the screen up front, uh, another vantage point of the room. Um, this is something interesting we've been working on. Um, it's kind of a, a gull wing uh, partition system. The thinking is, is that it would mount onto desks and would be in an upright position. Um, so you'd be able to go into and sit down and then uh, almost like an airline tray. Uh, so it would basically be able to kind of uh, pop, uh, pop up, down and move towards you uh, in such a fashion that by the time it's set up, you've created um, kind of a, a clear partition. Again, this is uh, something where you've got uh, your permanent desks as opposed to maybe more traditional classroom type things where you can't space it. But um, it's just something I wanted to point out that there are ways to still solve for that. Um, so I picked obviously something that was uh, more challenging as it relates to um, smaller classroom um, training uh, type of venues. And again, that, that's the smaller belly band I was talking about where if you had a flip down seat like an auditorium um, where it can come around um, and straps. So again, a, a cool vantage point of, of training rooms. And again, you can kind of see them in their down position uh, versus an up position, um, something we were looking at. Um, we'll migrate up to the, uh, the second floor in terms of just bar areas and food service. Um, bars right now, especially in the restaurant world, are like something that people have no interest in trying to open. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they obviously are an important part of, of hoteling and conference centers and typically areas where a lot of people are going to want to congregate. Um, this is a thinking as um, basically mandates get loosened, um, where it may not still be allowed to be like 100% crowding. Um, one thought was to create a solution that could be mounted along the bar um, that would serve two purposes. Um, and again, what we're seeing is seating arrangements that are between two and six people, depending upon what states you're in and depending upon what the restaurant regulations are. Uh, but this is, a, this is kind of a fixed partition system that would probably be up for a year or two, right? Until COVID is hopefully a thing of the past. Um, but the thought behind it is that you'd have a barrier between the, um, the consumer and the bartender, but there would be a, a pass through for beverages and food. Um, so this again could be a potential um, use for food service applications, uh, again for two tops and three tops, um, and or if you do have booths, we have uh, table clamp units um, that would allow as people are, are again migrating uh, through a particular open area or being asked to distance um, to basically place their order through one of those slots. Um, these are again semi-permanent to permanent solutions um, as bars begin to reopen. Um, and then in closing, just again, if there were larger auditoriums, um, we have just another way of looking at it. Again, very similar to um, more or less a traffic pattern, navigating people uh, into the specific unit uh, to perhaps you'd come down one way, come across the seating and back out. Um, similarly, trying to get people to do that this way. Um, and then using um, you know, belly bands, you can see again, particularly how any auditorium uh, can be um, you know, shaped to um, you know, minimize the seating um, for an opportunity where right now you're going to definitely have to cut capacity by about 50%. And again, you can kind of see how they can be you know, uniquely branded to a specific venue or a specific conference. And once again, all of these assets are changeable. So uh, this poster can be updated. It could be something specifically related to um, the, the conference. This could actually even be nothing about COVID it just might be like who's speaking in the room that particular day um, and, and all of uh, that good stuff. Um, so this kind of rounds out the, what I would consider to be the rendering portion um, of the um, presentation. Um, and what um, specifically we have, um, and I'll send a link to our website, is you know everything that I've shown you is stuff that exists. These are all standard, parts and pieces. We have 21 different types of extrusion systems. 
uh, that can be uniquely personalized and finished. Um, the standard color is a satin anodized aluminum, so it's, it's meant to look um, pretty much disappear into the backdrop. But once again, it can be uniquely tailored with a material or a printed graphic on the top or the bottom. Uh, this is our example was a close up of the, uh, the banquet, you know, in terms of a, a catering table, again, on wheels and casters, so they can be kind of uh, moved along. Um, this system, again, was the idea behind kind of that welcome uh, or, or, or an attendee. So we have a standard units that are a three bay, a five bay. Um, these can actually be, if you remember the rendering, folded back into 45 degree or um, 90 degree angles, so it can create returns in that they can be hinged. Freestanding partitions. Um, these are foldable. These are like um, almost like shoji screens. So these are like uh, zigzags where um, if you have common areas um, and you need to create kind of a, a little bit of a break within the room, uh, this is also another physical asset that can be deployed. These are some of those uh, bar uh, and desk um, and uh, bar height types of partition systems which are available to you. Uh, clamp on systems as it relates to uh, tables and fixed positions. These are all the movable items that we have. We have units that have little uh, feet uh, that again, these are pressure fit, uh, can be um, disassembled and, and laid, you know, packed flat. Um, and again, this is one of the other ones uh, that we had made, which are completely movable for conference rooms and bars. And again, this would be more set up for that kind of banquet table I was showing you earlier. Uh, again, it could be as simple as white, black, or any kind of a wood a tone that would be appropriate. Um, and then in closing is kind of the signage and graphics kit. Uh, these are all standard designs that we have that we would then uniquely tailor to your venue and or the specific event. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're semi-permanent to permanent. Um, the floor graphics are designed for, you know, tile, um, commercial carpet, um, concrete. Um, so they can be you know, laid down um, and um, reused and peeled up um, pretty economically. I again mentioned things like you know, venue or policy signage using all paper-based inserts, Mark. Um, this is where the economics come in. You don't want to really keep investing in, in plaques that are permanent, but you can invest one time in our MAGA frame. That would be an eight and a half by 11 or 22 by 28. And what this enables you to do is to you know, prevent uh, doing the old hand drawn or Microsoft Word, you know, printing out your paper and maybe taping it up. Um, it just creates a little bit of a level of uh, professionalism that you can print on demand and, and put into this flexi polycarbonate uh, face. Same thing is with all of our stands. So again, we have a number of different um, freestanding units that operate the same way. This lifts up, a paper insert goes in. These are designed for countertoppers. Uh, and again, you know, lots of COVID-19 kind of PSA posters um, and cones and standing signs, as well as we talked a little bit about the uh, belly bands, uh, larger wall murals or larger uh, floor graphics. Again, if you just wanted to send one strong message on the floor that we're going to keep to, you know, kind of this, this kind of a six foot spacing. Um, so, you know, we're a, a little bit under, I wanted to leave time. Uh, really what I'm mostly interested in is uh, getting comments and feedback um, relative to, you know, are we on to something? Um, did I successfully predict maybe some of the challenges that you've been thinking about? Um, and really hopefully get into some kind of a dialogue um, in closing. But once again, we literally are single source uh, in that we have a very strong design and an architectural interior design component, uh, graphic design capabilities, and we can fabricate uh, and ship uh, not only domestically but worldwide um, and again uh, anybody you know, who's welcome to obviously take a screenshot um, we have a website right now uh, that's dedicated just towards wellness and um, it'll be interesting we're going to be publishing this deck in a, in a on there specifically related to uh, venues but we have about another half dozen ones up right now with restaurants uh, office reopenings health and fitness for example if any of you have venues that have gyms um, and uh, education uh, as a thing. So I'm going to turn it back to you, Mark, to um, you know, see uh, any Thank questions you. or comments. That's great, and, uh, and a great journey through. And what I'm going to do first, I'm gonna, I've got a couple of questions for you related to timescales and, and, and how projects uh, 
uh, approach for me. But what, just before I ask you those questions, Patrick, um, I'd like to ask our audience, you know, what was the favorite, what was your favorite item or the item that you thought um, had the most possibility and probability to be uh, a part of your own setup? Um, and when we finish with that, I'm going to ask um, you to vote on, or, or tell us which item do you think have no place in a conference centre and you, you, you hope that you would never see it. Um, because I'm sure, <laughs> you know. Um, but um, the two questions I got for you, you talked at the beginning about being creative with the messages and not um, making it look like a hazardous material zone. And that's really important for our members. You know, that, that I've had many, many conversations around that, we, you know, how do we bring hospitality back into our spaces whilst respecting everything that we need to do to project a message of uh, confidence and, and build trust? Um, what are you seeing out there? Because I, I just have this feeling that over time we're going to get more creative um, yes. and more creative and more creative. What are you seeing? Um, what direction is it going in? And is there a cutoff point between maybe use of of humor to serious messaging. Yeah, um, well, the one thing that we did here stylistically, you know, anybody who's you know, familiar with graphics, first thing is, is that we, we tried to use, you know, a lot of like cooler illustrations. Um, there's a lot of my competitors, there's a lot of um, um, firms in general that are trying to get people to, to, I guess, behave from a standpoint of fear, right? Using fear to motivate versus a sense of community um, and collaboration and looking out for one another. Um, you know, just little subtle cues, like trying to use things like, you know, please sanitize your hands before entering, um, using, I guess, more simple and, and I think friendlier iconography. Um, you know, all shared spaces must be kept clean. You know, there's just, there's just this, a graphic style here, Mark, that we're trying to communicate on. Um, there are a lot of things where you see like PSA type posters that speak to statistics and, and start getting really into the, for lack of a better word, the gory details related to this uh, to this element, um, and and you know, we're trying to do something that feels a little bit friendlier, and and if possible, maybe it could even be a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, but what I would say is we'd really want to capture the personality of either the uh, the group that's 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 being in attendance, as well as again what's going to make your specific facility um, feel unique, right? And I, and I looked right. a lot at the IACC uh, the membership, and you have like these places that are like out in the woods, um, just just super beautiful, and then some are very high tech looking. Um, so I think the think is the thinking behind what I would do is embrace uh, kind of the culture of that environment, and then have the graphics begin to tie back and make it feel a little bit more uh, cohesive with that physical. And your team, your team, design team can do yep. that and take yep, that. Absolutely. That's great. Um, right. Well, we've got one comment in. Um, lots of getting comments saying they love, you know, everything looks great, great presentation. Um, love the partitions, especially for the banquet. But yep. is there any difficulty between people hearing each other between partitions, so across the table as you would normally talk in a, in a wedding or a banquet? I, I think that's going to be a, a combination of things. Um, number one, it's, it's the ambient sound levels. Um, the fact is that the partitions themselves, um, you know, they're really not like cones of silence. Um, uh, by, by design, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of airspace. They're really just trying to, and even these little subtle uh, elements here, like tapering this back. Um, yeah. When you look at it in scale, we're trying to get it where you're sitting at your chair um, and for a person say up to maybe six foot two or six foot four, where it would just go beyond their head. Um, so there's, there's definitely what I would consider to be enough airspace uh, from a sound perspective to be able to, to speak across the table. Um, there's definitely gaps, right, um, yeah. where you're going to be able to hear it. But I, I do not see it as being anything that's uh, impenetrable. The same thing even with when you walk up to the, to the banquet uh, station, um, there is, you know, this material uh, is such that, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's not like a complete sound barrier. And we can also create openings across the whole bottom. The, the, main, the main thinking here was to face-to-face -to -face, uh, contact. Yeah. When you're uh, standing. Yeah. That makes great sense. The, the other one, the one, the display, which is a couple of slides on from this, which I know you had in the, the lobby reception area, and um, you talked about it in the context of, of screening. It would be great screening 
for a, a sanitation test scenario. Yes. Uh, uh, thermal testing or anything like that. Um, so that that sprung to to mind when I this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Using those sort of those sort of options just to create a distance or, or create a separation between um, any any thermal testing or any other. We also have a we also have a stanchion uh, which I did not include in this mark on the website that does do that. So it's um uh, it's it's meant to be a barrier between someone taking you the temperature and somebody right. checking in, um, depending upon what systems you were using. Whether it's literally um you know some of them are very high tech where you just kind of walk up to it now and it 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 will do it for you, uh, to just maybe manually using a digital thermometer. So. Um, well, certainly one of the feedbacks is that the um, the countertop partitions that incorporate the sign holders are, are great for displaying the messages and and not re and reducing clutter um, and keeping a uniform look. But um, what I'd really like you to share with everybody today before uh, the webinar closes, Patrick, is you know what what is the process if if you're a general manager of a property, this is your first um, sort of um, the, the beginning of thinking about. What, what you're going to put in place at your property that's still closed today. What are mm -hmm. the stages um, of going through this with, with, um, so with yourselves? And what are the time scales? Well, you know, from start to finish, what does, what does it take in terms of time to get things into place? Because so that's a great life. question. Uh, again, in a, in a pre-COVID world, we have a geographically dispersed um, sales force, right? So in a perfect world, we would, we would be able to do a physical walkthrough um, and conduct uh, what we consider to be an audit of the physical space. Um, the, the first thing I don't want to go back is to like looking at the entire venue for a moment. Um, working remotely for all intents and purposes, we would be relying upon um, some levels of floor plans um, that, that may exist. Um, and what we basically do is an initial assessment of uh, this strategic thinking, right? What kind of elements and assets would we need to take the venue from this particular state into a post-COVID reopening strategic way of thinking? Um, that generally takes about two weeks, um, depending upon either how big the venue is and or what kind of um, backlog we have. But we have 13 full-time designers on staff um, that are basically have become, <laughs> for all intents and purposes, you know, resident uh, COVID conversion experts. Um, so you've got about a two week lag to get an, a remote assessment. Um, we also have a network of about 3,500 installers. So um, because that's at a local level, um, if it was either temporarily reopened, um, you know, we can send somebody in to do a photo audit, um, just get some, some kind of pictures, a little bit of the, the flow, uh, by having uh, somebody walk around with a camera or asking literally the, the general manager of the space to give us some type of visual cues, um, as simple as just taking photographs of rooms, taking a, a little assessment of what types of tables and chairs are in existence. So that again, that whole first process is like a two to three week um, uh, strategy. Um, during that though, we do really wanna get an understanding of the brand, um, uh, whether it's uh, what, what that look and feel, uh, what the logo, um, what the what the kind of the I'd say the culture of the conference and meeting center and what you stand for um, And then we would move into what I would consider to be that specialized messaging mark um, to kind of create um, unique fixtures um, Unique patterns of things that feel again organic to what that venue looks like uh, so it doesn't look like something just was just bought off of the shelf um, not very carefully thought out um, the whole idea is to make it feel like Quite frankly, this will probably be around for a little bit, so we want it to look as integrated into the to the venue as possible. Um, that's about a, a five to seven day process, which is let's call it the graphics or the reskinning. Um, once we've been approved on a budget, because that happens concurrently, um, it's very hard to do a budget until you do an initial assessment. Uh, there is a fee with uh, the actual planning exercise, uh, depending upon how how much space uh, we're talking about. Uh, but again, there's a lot of repetition. We've done so many of these things right now that we pretty much have a formula down relative to how these things get done. Ultimately, when we fabricate, we're about four to six weeks to fabricate um, different elements. Again, using a lot of our partition systems, these are all stocked and inventoried um, uh, both aluminum and steel um, posts and panels that we leverage. Um, and right now, acrylic is still a very, very hot commodity. Um, we've been very fortunate to stay ahead of that. 
um, in that we continue to buy trailer loads worth of plexiglass. Um, so we still have an adequate stock of not only plexiglass, but we also have even imported right now, we have right now about a thousand still left in inventory, um, sanitizing units that take liquid sanitizer if you for some reason can't come about to it. Um, so at the, from beginning to end, Mark, quite frankly, it's, it's, it's at least about a two month process, about eight weeks. Um, and it can be as long, depending upon how massive the venue is, potentially as long as 10 or 12 weeks. So um, you know, we're in the summer right now. Uh, we are dealing with a lot of uh, school and educational debates. Um, there's a lot of fits and starts in, in two of our verticals. Schools, if they're reopening or not reopening, are going to do remote learning through the fall. And we're having the same type of thing going on right now with restaurants, where a number of our customers opened and are now shutting down and reversing. Um, so it's a little bit um, hard for us to forecast, but I think that's a very safe uh, range, uh, Mark, in terms of uh, planning and consultancy and being able to convert. That's great. Uh, that, that's helpful to know, particularly as for all of us, if we're thinking of we're going to be reopening in the fall or at the end of the year, this takes time to, to plan out. And you're right, we, we, this is influenced by how other sectors are opening up in between as well. Um, right. Now I'm going to ask you the last question that's um, here from um, one of our attendees, TJ, but because we're in the hospitality industry, we always like to put a face to a name. So I wonder if you've got the uh, option to put your camera on so that everyone can oh. see uh, who Patrick is. Um, sure. uh, but that always that always helps. Uh, we're we're sure. people people. Great. Hi, Patrick. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. So um, TJ is asking the question, most of the seating that you show is not six feet apart. Is that because you think we will be moving closer um, with masks on soon? Or you know, it, I know it's... It's a crystal ball question, but what's your thinking behind that? Well, again, I'm taking cues uh, from uh, retailers, um, and you just see a continuous onslaught of, you know, no mask, no service, right? So whether it be Walmart, um, you know, to Starbucks, um, venturing into a venue where you're going to be in some proximity to some people, it seems that masks are just going to be mandated. Um, the fact that you're using masks, um, and that's part of the kind of the PPE that's being executed, um, our thinking is is that as long as you use that in conjunction with about the six foot rule, which continues to, to, to basically hold whether you go to a, a Lowe's or a, a shopping center, um, you've probably all encountered it. Same with the supermarkets. If you've been out shopping domestically or abroad, um, they have one way aisles. So again, we're, we're, we're following a lot of those leads. Um, I, I don't see that disappearing um, anytime soon. Uh, you know, again, the crystal ball, I feel globally until there really is, you know, some form of vaccine or, or herd immunity, um, I, I just don't see this going away for the next 12 to 18, possibly 24 months. Some of these might be longstanding practices um, for the future. So I think the more we potentially embrace some of these things, um, one thing I do want to comment on, and, and it's, it's a little bit of a, a lesson learned, um, some of our customers in the restaurants, uh, because obviously they're under a tremendous amount of financial pressure and strain, um, did take shortcuts, right? So they, they opened up um, with what I would consider to be very inferior, um, the priced and produced elements, um, and just under normal wear and tear, ongoing sanitization protocols, um, engaging with the customers. Um, a lot of things where I've put bids in and I was a little bit higher, um, you know, we had lost and now a lot of people are coming back because I think their thinking was very short-sighted. It was like, uh, well, we're only going to need this for a few months and things are going to reopen. So during those early stages, let's call it April and May and June, um, I think most people were looking at this a little bit short-sighted. And I think in your world, um, there's probably going to have to be a level of investment um, to get, obviously, your customers to feel safe and that you're taking it seriously. Um, and that would just be yeah, my great, last. Great wise words to, to end on, Patrick. And I think we all appreciate that our thinking is shifting in terms of how long we need to be prepared for. So as we close today, um, thank you very much for you know for the detail you've done on it. And we're, we're excited to keep in touch with you as you develop more solutions for conference centers and hotels and start to share those. We, um, our members can get to you as an associate member through the associate area of our website um, and indeed 
through uh, downloading the crisis, um, sorry, the critical pathway for reopening your venues, which is on both the IAC COVID resource page where you can follow the link there or go straight to the IAC store. And uh, the first item in the IAC store is, uh, is that guide where you can order it. And it's cost free for all IAC members globally. Um, but, um, but I will just hand over to Kate now to close today's session. And thank you once again, Patrick. Oh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. And hopefully it was, you know, people time well spent. Um, and it's again, I'm really, really pleased to be a new member um, and looking very forward to hopefully meeting a bunch of you if you guys host your own conference in the future. Well, you are going into that one. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick, and thanks, Mark. Um, so as we said earlier, the session recording is going to be forwarded to you all uh, later today. Uh, our next session is next Thursday, uh, the 23rd of July, uh, where we're delighted to welcome back uh, Cindy Novotny from Master Connection Associates, uh, who's going to be telling us a little bit more about their Rebound series, uh, looking at rebounding with passion and presence and profits. Uh, you can register for that webinar, along with all our future webinars, on our lineup page on the IAC website. Um, and just a reminder there, if any of you have missed any of our recent sessions, we do now have an on-demand facility, so you can, at your leisure, go on and pick up uh, some of those sessions. Um, we'd like to wish you all a very pleasant rest of your day and look forward to welcoming you all back on another session in the very near future. Take care, everyone. <laughs>